This episode is brought to you by Gempler's Farm and Home Store, family-owned and based right here in Wisconsin. Shop Gemplers.com for winter workwear from Carhartt, Patagonia, and more. Clothing and footwear orders of $50 or more ship free with free returns every day. Visit the deals page at Gemplers.com for more offers. Welcome to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast. This is Chuck for Moses. For the final installment of our series in Pollinator Habitat, we have a really engaging workshop from the 2020 Moses Conference by Joan Olson of Prairie Drifter Farm and Sarah Foltz Jordan of the Xerxes Society. The two have worked together for the past several years establishing Pollinator Habitat at Joan's Farm. And the joy of what they do really comes through as they share the process they've taken to plant insectary strips, pollinator-friendly cover crops, native wildflower meadows, and hedgerows. They also talk through planting methods, design, weed control options, and organic site preparation methods. I've put a link in the show notes to their slides if you want to follow along. Make sure to join me and all four of our podcast guests from this series for a Zoom training and Q&A session on Tuesday, December 15th at 10.30 a.m. Central Time. The link to register is in the show notes. Let's get to it. I learned about Xerxes when I came to Moses in 2012 and I heard Eric Mater speak and I was really inspired and I don't remember a lot of details but the one thing that stuck out for me was beetle banks and insectary strips and I was like that sounds really cool and he talked about this thing that you could do with the NRCS and you could have a conservation activity plan written for your farm and I was really inspired Um, so from that talk at Moses I went to our local NRCS office and asked what we could do and on how that would work and then we got hooked up with Sarah and she's amazing and she likes to nerd out over insects like we do so that's been a really great (laughs) collaboration So this is just a quick glimpse at our farm. Like I said, it's 33 acres. Um, You can see the different trials that we've done along with Xerxes, um, solarization trials, insectary strips, pig trials, native hedgerows. We're gonna talk about all of these things in this presentation. Yeah, and I'll just add that, I mean, it's so special for me to be co-presenting with Joan because this is an example of one of few farms that's really implemented almost every habitat approach in the book and also tried all these different kind of experimental organic site prep methods, totally went out on a limb with me in a lot of cases to do things that we had no idea if they were going to work. They and didn't. some of them didn't, and that's some okay. Of them didn't, and we've learned a lot. So, so yeah, this is really fun. You know, our talk is titled Pollinators. We're going to be talking a lot about pollinators, but it's not just pollinators that habitat is supporting. Actually, a lot of the farmers that I work with, especially organic farmers, are even more interested in natural pest control that habitat supports, so the the good bugs that fight the bad bugs. Um, Because if, if you're not using pesticides or very many pesticides, you're really counting on these, these unseen heroes of your farm. So that's things like lacewings, lady beetles, both of which feed on soft-bodied crop pests, um, parasitoid wasps, which will parasitize cutworms, all kinds of, all kinds of insects. Um, and I mean, we could have slides and slides just, just on the insect diversity that's attracted to these plantings. And it's not that surprising. So habitat is key. Pests thrive in monocultures, but beneficial insects need more. They need more structure for nesting. They need a diversity of flowers for foraging. Uh, landscape complexity enhances natural beneficial insect populations in 74% of cases. This is an example of a, a photo I took on a farm in southern Minnesota, and the farmer was actually apologizing to me for the messy rock pile and brambles that he'd been intending to clean out of his row crop fields. Um, and that was really the best place for, for insect nesting that I saw on that entire farm. <laughs> so if we can change our kind of our farm aesthetics and leave more brush and rocks and messy stuff, and our yards too, that's really a meaningful thing. Yeah, one of our kids' favorite things when they were about four was stick piles. And I remember oh, Sarah yeah. coming to our farm and be like, that's so great. <laughs> that's what you need to be doing is stick piles. So we did it unintentionally then after that. Um, so this, the way that we're going to do this presentation, it's going to come in two parts. The first part is just what are the options for pollinator habitats? So what are the different types of pollinator habitats you can install? 
And then in the second part, we'll talk about process, the like nitty gritty how to's. And Sarah is the wise woman who has the whole ball of wax in her brain. I'm really here to kind of tell you about what we've done at our farm, what's worked, what hasn't, and to share some on the ground stories. Joan is keeping it real because I feel like it's one thing for me as a conservation biologist to stand up here and say, you should do this on your farm and this on your farm and that on your farm. But actually implementing things, these things is tricky and <laughs> sometimes not as compatible as you might like with your crop production. And hopefully Joan can, can bring in a lot of that perspective. Um, so here we're just pointing out there are a lot of different habitat options uh, in agricultural landscapes and we will talk in quite a bit of detail about some of these, not all of them, so I'm just going to kind of run through them now. Native field borders, so putting habitat on the edges of your fields, uh, converting retired crop land or fallow areas that really aren't being better used, native insectary strips, so more linear habitat integrated into your farm, beetle banks, cover crops and inner crops and, and other annual flowering options, flowering hedgerows, so native flowering shrubs are just an amazing habitat feature. If you have wet areas on your farm, you'll be thinking about wetlands and filter strips, buffers. If you have livestock, maybe flowering pasture um, or rangeland. If you have orchards, uh, there are options for, this is kind of tricky um, and nuanced, but there are options for getting more flowers in, in the understory of your orchard, including both non-native and native. And if you're dealing with pesticide drift from conventional neighbors, perhaps there's some options for, for coniferous drift protection buffers that, that we'll talk through a little bit. So I'm just going to jump right into these different habitat options, um, starting with kind of the most common one in this region, Native wildflower plantings. So these tend to be, you know, maybe a quarter acre up to 10, 20 acres, but larger block plantings uh, of native vegetation intended to be permanent, long lived. This might come in the form of a CRP planting that you could get, in, you know, incentivized by um, farm bill programs or conservation cover through EQIP programs. And yeah, I mean, the list goes on. So this is an example of our farm, of one of those installations. Um, we bought our farm in 2010, and when we looked at the farm in the fall of 2010, it was actually the bulk of this, come over here, um, this was all continuous corn when we first got there. And the corn in the spots that you can see kind of X out here was this high in September, and we realized quickly that that was really not appropriate vegetable land, and that's what we were doing. And so we knew that right off the bat we had to do something with that land come spring, because it wasn't gonna grow vegetables and we we're gonna to have to manage it somehow. So we had an FSA loan for our farm, which already had then connected us to our local NRCS office because they share a building. And so we went to our local NRCS office in the winter and said, hey, what can we do? What's out there? And then they um, directed us towards the EQIP program. And through that, we had funding to install a five acre field border that we installed in native grasses and forbs, and then a one acre filter strip. Because this running through our land is a waterway that's man-made enhanced. And we have a very wet farm, and we recognize that more and more, especially over the years, and maybe some of you have noticed this too, our farms get wetter and wetter, water tables are rising, so we just really have to take care of some of those lower areas. So that was an early diverse mix of grasses, like I mentioned, and forbs. It was early on in our farm career when we had no money, so I was super stingy with the forbs, and I think going back, what I would have done is spend a little more money to have a little higher density of the forbs in that initial mix. But the NRCS office helped us with what's going to be appropriate for our soils. We love that web soil survey some people have mm -hmm. talked about. That's just a really nice way to get an overall look at your farm. And then um, just like what flowers are going to be appropriate. You want to have blooms all across the season, which Sarah will talk a little bit more about later. But this is what that is now. So literally that was continuous corn, that picture on the right-hand side when we first moved to the farm. And continuous wow. corn that just doesn't, wasn't really doing all that well. Just another quick example of this type of planting. This is a... One of my favorite farms in Iowa, Scattergood Farm. It's a Quaker school farm, working farm. Um, and they had about a, I want to say, half acre-ish area of the, the vegetable farm that was severe. The soil was severely eroding. The vegetables weren't performing very well. Mark will tell you this part of the farm always made him crabby. Um, and now it brings so much happiness. Um, but we converted that to, um, that's the pollinator palooza mix that Prairie Moon's which is just a very showy, fun, very floral, dense seed mix. 
And so I just did want to say in honesty, it doesn't mean that you never have to maintain or manage it again. So that the six acres that we did plant, I'll talk more about it later, but we have done a burn on that. We have done some grazing. We had to, have had to do some mowing. And there are weed issues that can come in. For us, our biggest wish issue is actually willow creeping in on that. So we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so now kind of switching gears to another strategy. This is taking that same type of native wildflower habitat, but instead of having it in a larger block planting, maybe you don't have room for that, um, just planting these long linear strips of habitat integrated into your crop fields. And this is increasingly popular with especially a lot of the vegetable farmers that I work with. Um, thinking about, if you're, if you're a vegetable farmer and you're organic and you're relying on a lot of cultivation for uh, weed control, most 70% of our native bees are ground nesting. So they're nesting in the soil. And it can be really beneficial to have these set aside strips in your farm where that tillage isn't happening. Also, thinking about some of those beneficial insects for pest control, some of them are tiny and have very short flight distances. So if you integrate the habitat into your fields, you're getting those services, the pollination and pest control services, right where you need it, much closer to where you need it, <coughs> compared with putting habitat over in another field or along the, the exterior of your farm. And that, this is a vegetable farm, smaller scale, um, but I'm showing you here another example of a farmer, uh, a couple of farmers that I work with in Montana, growing 5,500 acres of organic grains, and they have completed this amazing project um, in which they've integrated about 30 foot wide buffers of insectary strip buffers throughout their fields, totaling now over 100 acres of habitat. These are diverse, drought tolerant mixes. And really, nobody's doing anything like this. Last, last year, we had a field day out there with about 20 biologists who had never seen restoration that diverse in the state. And their, their neighbors think they're crazy, um, like off their rocker crazy, but it's it's a really amazing thing for wildlife and lots of multi-benefits on the farm. So you can see these strips are serving as wind reduction for their crops, a weed buffer for their cropland, capturing <coughs> excess nutrients um, in water, <coughs> reducing overland runoff, um, improving farm aesthetics and quality of life on the farm, uh, and serving as corridors for wildlife, in addition to the, the pollination and, and natural pest control services. Okay, so this is an example on our farm, and I actually just wanted to quick go back to something I started mentioning before. So I told you that I went to the NRCS office after the Moses Conference and um, talked to them about this thing called a Conservation Activity Plan, short form is CAP. There's all sorts of different conservation activity plans. It's um, IDing what you need for, con for conservation needs on your farm. What we were looking for was a, specifically a pollinator conservation activity plan, and what that meant was we applied for funding to have a TSP, I'm giving the jargon, because when you go into NRC office, office, you're like, what does that mean? TSP is a technical service provider, and I wanted to have this plan written for us, and at the time, there was two. It was the Xerxes Society and somebody else, I don't know who, and I don't know if there's more now. Like pe not. <laughs> people who officially can write a pollinator conservation activity plan for your farm, like, that was Sarah. <laughs> so she came onto our farm then in 2013, wrote the plan, walked our farm with me, looked at what we already had going on, and looked at what else we could do to really add to that habitat. And so this insectary strip idea, partly because I was super jazzed about it after Moses, was one of the plans that we did. And it was just piggybacking off of what Sarah said. Like, it was great for us to have that six acres of field border and filter strip. We really wanted to try to, like, get that into our production land, too. Um, but the hard thing is, like, I don't know how you are, but our, like, tillable acres that really grow stuff well, it's really hard to say, yeah, I'm going to give that to the pollinators, <laughs> what I want it for my vegetables. But these insectary strips are, like, really high, bang for your buck fairly small areas, but really effective is what we have found. So how that worked is we worked with Xerxes. Xerxes did provide some plugs for us that they had bought from a few different places, it was Prairie Moon, Prairie Restorations, I think. And then we also, because we have the equipment already, we have a greenhouse, we know how to grow transplants. We did a lot of transplant growing ourselves. So this strip is a really dense planting, um, various native perennial flowers, but also bunch grasses. And that was um, Sarah's suggestion for beetle banks, which we're gonna talk about later. So this is just like right next to us, you can see that was a winter squash field. And we just took a bed right on the edge already, not creating another edge in the middle of our field. Transplanted it just like we would all of our transplants. It was 22 inches apart. We have a four foot bed top. Our tractors can go over the whole thing. Um, I think we spaced them at about 12 inches a piece. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is my husband, Nick, then it's not, he's not cultivating this crop, but the idea is we have a super C cultivating tractor that he could just 
do the same cultivation method. He goes to the brassicas, goes to the instructory strip. And he really only had to do that the first year, like the, at the time that we transplanted it. I think he did it one, maybe two more times that year, cultivated in row. I think he did it then one time the next spring, and then it's just, it's got it. It doesn't really need our help with cultivation anymore because it's filled in really deeply. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later as well, but you can see we're starting from transplants. Up until this point in my work on farms, I'd primarily, and even on your farm, we'd primarily been doing projects starting from seed, which is less expensive, but has some issues in that it, it takes a long time for it to, to kick off. Um, you can have some weed management challenges. And so we tried this, this approach of, of working with transplants. And it, I mean, we're both so sold on it. And I've awesome. been, almost every farm now that I do strips with, that's, that's the way I want to go. Um, you can see this is, that's the next summer. Yeah, so this is June like. 2016. This is the next summer. Flowering, tall, beautiful, diverse flowering habitat. That's incredible. Um, very little weed management needed. You don't have to do a, a year of site prep in advance to control weeds. And, it, you know, the reason people don't do this is it's costly. You know, you, you plan on about a dollar per plant and a plant per square foot. If you um, buy but, them. Right? If you buy them. But you can really bring costs down if you're able to propagate some of them yourselves. And vegetable growers, know, that's what you know how to do. We are going to talk more in detail about how that works later, so don't say, like, oh, why'd you miss that? We're, we're yeah. going to talk about how to grow this transplant. We'll circle later. back to this. And here's just another example of a farm where we did this, and you can see, again, this rapid restoration, 2016 in June, following summer, beautiful, diverse flowering habitat. I want to say one part about the how-tos there is, like, how we decided, you know, how to space it. It was sort of random. You know, I think we was like, we want some forbs, we want some grasses, like two or three here, four, you know, four or five there. So it was just, kind of, we tried to just be a little bit random about how we placed it. Because one of the things I learned from Sarah is it was great to have that big field border with kind of forbs all over, but really it's less work for the insects if everything is in a mass planting, because there's more blooms, it's like, you know, one-stop shop for them. Um, and that was one of the reasons we did that yeah. as well. Yeah, we've done different things with this on different farms. It, I haven't introduced Sarah Nizzi yet in the back, but Sarah, raise your hand. Sarah's my Iowa counterpart, and we've done a lot of these strips in Iowa in the last couple of years. And some of those strips, we were thinking quite a bit about plant height, because we had some little things like world milkweed that never get very tall, and then big blue stem. And so we kind of meticulously sorted all the plants by height, and then arrange them in kind of a wave so you'd have some short stuff going into some tall stuff um, so that hopefully nothing gets too outcompeted. But yes, there's a lot of different ways to, to mess around with this. But I mean, that brings us to another point. There, when you use the plugs, you have a lot of control and you have that design element, which you don't have when you're just throwing seeds out. And then just for management, we do then mow that once a season. I'm um, just mow, mow it high because we also learned from Sarah that a lot of the insects that you want are in the stems of the plants, the woody, like woody stems of the plants. Okay, so moving on to a new practice now. This is beetle bank. So pretty similar. Again, we've got this linear strip of habitat integrated into a, a crop production field. Uh, but in this case, you can see it's just grasses. Um, native grasses, mostly native bunch grasses. And the idea here is that you're trying to attract and support <coughs> predatory uh, beneficial beetles, like ground beetles and fireflies and soldier beetles and other things that need that refuge for nesting and, and, and overwintering. Um, and these are really important biocontrol agents on the farm, I guess you could call them. They're eating weed seeds, and they're also preying on, on um, insect pests. So they, most of them are nocturnal. They come out at night and really just clean up your fields. And I honestly, I have a hard time planting beetle banks without putting some flowers in, because if, if you have limited space and you're setting it aside for habitat, it makes sense to me to bring in the flowers for, for pollinators as well. And grasses are really easy to grow if you are going to do the thing where you, you start from seed in your greenhouse and grow your own plugs. Grasses are easy. OK, again, we've got a linear strip of habitat, in this case, um, we're just looking at annuals. So these are really easy to grow, temporary mass flowering habitat, low cost, rapidly blooming. You get blooms that very first year, minimal site prep. Um, and I think this approach is, I mean, it's an awesome way to get your foot in the door um, and really start to see what a difference flowers make on your farm in terms of insect activity. But it's also really nice if you have, if you have land that you're not ready to commit to permanent habitat but you're not doing anything with this season, why not put it in some flowers and kind of get your feet wet in that way? 
The, the main issue from an insect perspective with these non-native annuals is that even though they do provide some forage value, there's pollen and there's nectar and you'll see butterflies and bees foraging on them, they don't provide food for most Lepidoptera. So you all know how monarchs can only feed on milkweed. That's most butterflies and moths. They can only feed on certain host plants and, and those host plants typically need to be native. So the, the green vegetative tissue of, of these plantings is not highly edible, um, which is why this isn't enough. It's great to do annual plantings, it's great to do cover cropping, but native habitat really is, is where it's at. And this is just some examples of different species that are available for, for these types of annual plantings. Things like this is a strip on uproot farm showing sunflowers integrated into vegetables. Alyssum, Cecilia, red clover, cosmos, you've used. Joan has some more examples from her farm. Yeah, so the one on the left is actually, we just grow flowers every year because they're pretty. I don't, I don't cut bouquets and sell them, but our CSA members can come and cut them if they want. I just like a splash of color. So we have done various things as like salvia, cosmos, different kinds of marigolds, sunflowers, um, gonfrina, just a wide variety. So whatever you want to plant is great. Um, and then the middle one, this is actually in the middle of a production field. And that we intentionally seeded to be an annual insectary strip in our production field. So what's in there is cosmos, bachelor buttons, <coughs> cilantro, dill, tulsi. I don't know if anyone just went to the medicinal plant herbal. Here's a cool thing about all this habitat stuff is a ton of it can also be used as medicinals or as tea. Um, mm -hmm. So there's like a total double whammy benefit to that if, if that's something that you're interested in. So tulsi is great, like she said, and there's tons of bees in the tulsi. So again, that was planted, transplanted, just like all of our other transplants would be. It's in one single bed, transplanted with a transplanter or by hand, watered just as all the other plants would be, cultivated just like the other plants were, and you just get to let it go to seed. So we also plant cilantro and dill for a CSA, but now we've gotten to the point where instead of just you know incorporating it when we're done harvesting it, we let it go to flower, which is really easy because it's like the thing we don't want to happen, but here it's like, no, you're doing a good thing. It went to flower, it went to seed. And there are so many insects on the flowers of the cilantro and dill. It's crazy. And this is where, when you had that field day with the kids, I think most of the kids spent their time in the cilantro and the dill because it was just mm -hmm. a haven. If all you can do is this year, I'm just gonna let my cilantro go to flower, it's, it's a place to be in. Yeah. I also want to say just we control, we are able to cultivate the, that strip within our regular field with just cultivation with our super seed tractor. Um, this flower is actually planted on, on the left hand side is the landscape fabric with holes burnt into it every nine inches. Like a lot of flower growers will do that. So we never weeded that. It was just like, it could be pretty, we could enjoy it, and we didn't have to think about it as a piece of work on our farm, really, once it was planted. Okay, so moving on now to a new practice, cover cropping, which is probably not anything new uh, for most of you. Um, but just thinking about, if, if you're doing that, you're doing this for many reasons, right, if you're planting covers, but if you wanna really benefit pollinators, um, it's important to allow your cover to actually bloom before incorporating or mowing um, or terminating. And sometimes that can be challenging, like with something like buckwheat, you've got this beautiful full bloom, it's full of insects, um, and you don't want it to set seed, so you have to kind of time it right such that you're, you're getting that bloom benefit, but you're not maybe creating a weed issue the next, the next year for yourself. And there are a lot of different options for flowering covers, but buckwheat is a key one. If you haven't grown buckwheat, I mean, you'll, you'll see immediately how attractive it is to insects. These are some trials that we did on a handful of farms in Minnesota a few summers ago, um, just comparing establishment and insect visitation of what kind of low diversity mixes, so oats, in this case, oats, peas, and medium red clover, um, with that same OP mix, but more diverse clovers that bloom a little bit longer and earlier and longer, um, and then a really diverse mix with clovers and buckwheat and sunflower and phacelia and Joan Prairie Drifter was one of the farms in that trial. So I don't know if you have any takeaways yeah. from that. Well, so we had some current concerns about that really diverse mix. I think we had maybe actually 20 species in that yeah. mix. It was like, we're just going to really try it. Um, and so I think the bulk of it was we had three different kinds of clovers that all had a different bloom time. And then we had put in phacelia, buckwheat, just, and then several different kinds of sunflower, like maybe four different yeah. kinds of sunflowers. Um, and I, I think we had had oats in there just to get it started, just to take off. It was super diverse, and so because we were concerned about the weed problem, halfway through the season, when things were getting really tall, 
um, Nick mowed half the field and then left the other half. The part that he left clearly had more bloom for longer. The part that he mowed, more of the clovers came back, but it wasn't super dense. The next year, I mean, we could have had a total memory loss, but I don't remember any real weed issues there. You know, we, we were able to incorporate with tractors, and I don't recall having any weed issues the next year that were, I don't even really remember. And it. you did, I remember you did take the precaution of not planting seed crops there and starting stuff that you started with transplants. Right, so right. That yeah, that's true. Yeah, we didn't direct seed into that field the next year. We transplanted into it for that exact reason. And but yeah, Sarah, you came out one day and did an insect count, and it wasn't in just like a three foot space, there's like six species of bees. I don't it was remember, super but cool. probably. <laughs> yeah, it was really, really neat. Um, this is just, again, some other things. <laughs> that was an accidental. We had buckwheat seed in with our oats and peas. And we're like, that was silly. And then it's like, oh, it's not so silly. There's still flowers here. So, But we do full plantings of buckwheat as well, so we'll have full crops. But then the hairy vetch, we actually have an area that's just super wet in our farm. And this last year, we thought we had it planted the, to wheat and vetch in the fall, thinking we'd try to, try to get into the spring. We were literally never able to work that field because it was wet all year long. So we just let the fledge go to flower. And there are so many insects in there. And the other thing I actually learned from Claire, who's in here, and um, grew a plot on our farm, was we had had vetch in that field where they grew the year before. And a little bit came in along the edge of the field that they just left. And it was thick with ladybugs, as I recall. Is that correct, Claire? I think. Um, so we actually started leaving some veg on edges just for ladybug, as ladybugs as well, because it seemed like they just really loved it. OK, so most of these examples so far have been on smaller vegetable farms. And, but I just want to point out there are definitely ways to integrate these covers on larger scale farms. And this is a really neat example of a farm I've worked with out in Montana again that was so 8,000 acres of dry land, formerly dry land conventional wheat, and they've converted entirely to organic gradually um, as of 2017. I think they're fully organic. And they've done this by diversifying their cropping system pretty dramatically, um, not just growing wheat, but also growing oilseed crops and other grains, and incorporating um, covers, and most, most importantly, alfalfa which they're using as a hay crop. So they've got this pretty sophisticated nine-year crop rotation that now includes plants that bloom and provide forage for pollinators. But more importantly, that's 8,000 acres that are now not being treated with insecticides and, and fungicides. Um, so just amazing. And this is just a research study showing that these flower and cover crops really do work to enhance pest control. So in this case, um, Flower and cover crops near soybean fields, um, buckwheat in particular, increased wasp parasitism of stink bug eggs by two and a half times. And I just think these photos are amazing. So this is the, this is the stink bug pest, and this is the beneficial insect, the tiny, tiny parasitoid wasp that lays its eggs on the eggs of stink bugs. So that's, how, that's, that's invisible to us, pretty much. I mean, we're not seeing this happening, but, but it's so important. Another approach that we're not going to spend too much time on um, is just the idea, but I, I did notice some of you have, have livestock. So just this idea of trying to diversify your flowering pastures and your rangeland if you have that, including diverse legumes or other forbs that provide pollen and nectar and ensuring that there's adequate rest periods such that those flowers actually are allowed to bloom. And here we have native flowering rangeland that's being grazed. So at least in, in the conservation world, sometimes there's this idea that, that grazing and native habitat isn't compatible. It's actually quite compatible. At this farm, in just one snapshot of time, um, in mid-July, we were able to walk around this, this actively grazed rangeland that had never been plowed, which is pretty special, and find over 30 different native wildflowers that were actually in bloom at that moment in time. Um, and there's examples in Iowa, in Minnesota, folks who are really trying to implement this idea of native pasture. So you've got untilled land and livestock production. And I'm, I'm looking at Steve Tomford in the back here. Steve's an ecologist who will tell you that land is not truly restored unless it's grazed, right? <laughs> so talk to Steve if you want to know more about that. OK, so another strategy is, is native flowering hedgerows. This is one of my very, very favorite approaches. And it's very, it's easy. It's very foolproof. It, it can be a good strategy if you've got weed issues and you're 
certainly not going to have a lot of success working from seed and maybe plugs are challenging. Going in with a bigger shrub that you're protecting can be a, a safer way to go. But from, from the insect perspective, these shrubs are important in that they're providing early spring forage. So things like willow that bloom really early and then a lot of your like crab apples and wild plums and June berries, um, most of them have, have a fairly early bloom and a bloom that kind of goes from early spring to late spring to early summer. So there's a little bit of bloom succession there too. Uh, they also provide important nesting resources for stem nesting insects. I told you that 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. The remaining 30 or so percent use dead stems. So little branches that have hollow um, spaces or, or even the pithy centers of prairie plants. Uh, hedgerows can also provide screening, wind and dust reduction, living snow fences. What I love about them is, is how edible they are for us too. Um, there's so many options for um, edible, harvestable fruit, tea, seeds and berries for birds. Uh, and I already said that about there, that this is really nice when weed pressure is high. Here you can see a, a little serotina bee going inside a, a raspberry cane. And this is looking inside the nest. You can see the little, essentially little bedrooms for each offspring. And each little bedroom is provisioned with pollen and nectar for that larva to feed on as it develops. These are some of the key native flowering shrubs that, that I tend to use in, in our plantings, but the list really goes on. Yeah, a lot of these are also really important host plants for, for butterflies and moths. I want to say the, the Prunus genus hosts over 400 different kinds of butterflies and moths. They can only feed on the leaves of those plants. And you can do these in a, in a number of ways. This is one that was designed to be more of an edible hedgerow. This is that little hillberry farm in Northfield. And this one has a more diverse shrub component and then also a, a, a lower forb component too. So you can kind of tier the shrubs and the wildflowers if, if you want. So we did this on our farm as well in two different spots, uh, three different spots actually, but one was um, what Sarah talked about was drip protection. And we worked with the NRCS office and also our soil and water conservation district to get plants and get some funding for that as well through the EQIP grant. We did actually put it on landscape fabric just for weed control. And one of the things that we had to think about with the plants that we chose is we were trying to work with the areas that really weren't great for vegetable production. So we were looking at our wetter areas on the farm. And so we had to make sure that the shrubs that we were picking were wet tolerant because sometimes it can be really, really wet here. And then also we knew that, you know, weed management wise, we weren't gonna be able to get in there with very much besides mowing. So we chose elderberries, aronias, um, black currants, and dogwood. And the dogwood is for trimming red branches for the fall and it's super pretty. And it's really gorgeous in the winter, which we love to see during the winter time. And the one thing going back here that was a mistake that we made that I would caution you against is to plant them too closely. And we definitely planted them too closely and in the wrong arrangement. So the elderberries are utterly taking over the aronia right now. And if we do it again, we would have done it differently. So whenever, if this is something you're interested in, do the research or talk to Xerxes, um, talk to somebody who knows to get a really good, healthy spacing for whatever it is that you're looking for. So we definitely did this in part for, we can use this fruit. So you wanna look for varieties that are good fruits if you really wanna eat them as well. This is another trial we did with native hedgerows and Sarah had wanted us to try out this weed suppressant mat that they're trying um, in various places. And this is also, again, a really, really wet area. Um, we couldn't till this to save our lives before we planted this, so we just mowed it really short, laid down the mat, and dug holes for a, a wide variety of shrubs. So the one thing is this weed spreads mat is not organic, so this is literally the one strip on our farm that's considered conventional because of there's a synthetic binder in the weed suppressant mats. So it's just something for you to be aware of, but it's something you're interested in. And it doesn't, this is not plastic landscape fabric. It breaks down, it rips, there are holes in it, but the, the goal is again, you're just getting those plants to have a head start on the weeds so that they can get established. So it's not meant to be this forever barrier. And what else, what else you'd like to yeah, say? Yeah, and that? I mean, I guess just the nice thing is you don't, in this case, the intention is, and this doesn't always happen, but the idea is you're going to take that plastic out, which a lot of folks don't have, don't end up doing. And here you have something that just breaks down and you don't have to worry about removing. But if that's something you want to do and you're organic, you really need to talk to your certifier first. We had yep. Mosa as our certifier and we had a lot of conversations with them about how this needed to look on our farm. Um, but this is for real. 
So we also did, before we had planted that elderberry strip, the multiples, but we had planted dogwoods and this other part of our farm. We have um, a 33 acre farm and 24 acres of that is in a 10 foot deer fence because we have really horrendous deer pressure. And these first dogwoods that we planted were outside of that fence and me not knowing a whole lot about how fast they're supposed to grow, I was like, wow, those dogwoods are really slow. And wow, <laughs> now, oh my, we are two and still not flowering, man. And like, duh, um, deer. And so it was like two years later, we planted these other dogwoods. And I was like, oh. Inside the fence. Inside the fence. And I was like, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> so if you have deer pressure, you really do have to protect them. Not, we're, the story no. she's telling is not these not photos. Not the story. This is not um, my farm. Yes, yeah, so this is a different protection. <laughs> these but. are just a couple of other examples. If you don't have a deer fence, a couple of other ways you can protect your shrubs. And you can go around with pressure. temporary. And once they are established, they're really good. It's yeah. just those establishment years when things are small. So it's all going to be based on your land. OK, and I think this is one of our final little examples, but something that I feel like is really fun. And if, if any of you were in that last session, I guess that would, that would be relevant about the, the herbs and teas. But this was another example from Scatter Good Farm, where the students were really excited about planting a tea garden and being able to grow and harvest their own teas. So we. Um, pulled together a bunch of different native plants that provide tea and had a big field day with about 70 people where we sampled all these different native teas and just had a lot of fun together. So that's another fun option. So we just want to come back to this. To, so we've gone through all these different types of habitats and again, what that looks like on our farm. So I initially told you that we had that filter, the field border and filter strip in yellow. That was what we did through the NRCS with the EQIP grant. And then with Sarah, um, the green strips are these strips talking about solarization, which we haven't covered yet, and we're going to cover it in process, but we had four spots in our farm that we did solarization on. These are in the native insectary strips that I showed you that are perennials, and then um, native wetlands. We haven't talked about this yet, but we're going to in process where you see the pink is where we had run pigs through different areas to work on weed control and weed canary especially. And then um, finally, the native flowering hedgerows that I mentioned to you, those are where they are. So again, looking at the farm and just the kind of overhead blip, where you can see is where we've concentrated these plantings in general is the places that we couldn't use for vegetables. It was, I don't want to call it non-productive land, that's completely not fair to our, to our ecosystem, but it's, it's land that we weren't producing a sold crop on and we wanted to do something with it. It was providing more benefit than just like us having to go out and mow it or weed whack or something along those lines. So I just want to kind of give you an overall view of what we've done with Sarah and with Xerxes. Now for a quick break. Registration is now open for Growing Stronger, a collaborative conference on organic and sustainable farming. The conference will be held from February 22nd through the 27th, 2021. We are partnering with several other events, including the Grassworks Conference, the O'Grain Conference, the Midwest Organic Pork Conference, and the Organic Vegetable Production Conference to create this five-in-one virtual conference. Get $25 off if you register through the month of December. Scholarships are available for farmers and student groups. Go to bit.ly slash growingstronger2021 to check out the lineup of speakers and activities and to get your ticket. Now on to part two. Okay, so that was kind of part one, a bunch of different habitat options, and hopefully at least one of those sounds, sounds fun and doable for you and your farm. Um, but we're moving on now to talk about the habitat installation process, starting with habitat evaluation. So kind of thinking about what do you already have going on in your farm that's good? How do you protect that? And what are you missing? And how do you bring in those missing elements? Maybe it's spring bloom, maybe it's summer, fall bloom, maybe it's nesting sites, maybe it's protection from pesticides, what have you. The next step is site selection, so thinking about where you're going to place your, your habitat, planting design and species selection, and we'll talk through each of these. We're going to spend the most time on pre-planting weed control. Um, so especially when you're dealing with perennial habitat, it really pays to get your weed control done up front and minimize how much you're going to have to be dealing with weeds mixed in with your perennial planting um, throughout the duration of that, the lifespan of that project. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about habitat installation and then also ongoing weed management. So just starting with the, the site selection, there are a lot of example, <laughs> I don't know exactly how to say this, but 
But there's a temptation, I guess, if you're an organic farm and you have to put in a 30-foot buffer to think, and you want to do pollinator habitat, to think, that's a good place. I'm going to put my pollinator habitat in my buffer. Not such a good idea, um, considering those buffer spaces, if you're up against conventional, are likely to be impacted by pesticide drift. And pollinators are very sensitive to pesticide drift. That's not exactly, you don't want to attract pollinators to that habitat only to have them poisoned by pesticides. So we typically recommend, um, like what you're seeing here, this is a grass buffer um, or a coniferous buffer would be great for that 30 foot um, area. And try to put your habitat, and this can be hard, especially a lot of the farms in Iowa, it, it can be hard to find places where you're like, yes, this is protected and safe. But try to look at your own farm and think about where are the most protected areas for habitat and, and, and put your habitat there if you can. Um, there's obviously other considerations when you're deciding where to put habitat, including <laughs> soils and you, like you were talking about with productivity. Are you using this land for, for crop production or not? Is it accessible? It's, it's nice to have your habitat in a place that you actually interact with and see so you can keep an eye on weeds. Um, sometimes if you're doing hedgerows, you might need a place where you're, you have access to irrigation. So all kinds of things you'll be thinking about, but I just wanted to point out this little one with the, the buffer issue. Here's a photo from, again, from Little Hill Berry Farm in, in Northfield showing a coniferous drift protection buffer. So on, on the other side of this buffer is a conventional row crop farm. Then we've got the buffer. Then we have a little strip of native habitat. And then there's an organic blueberry farm that's out of the picture. But kind of just an example of how that might look on a farm. These coniferous buffers are nice because they're not flowering and attracting pollinators. The needle structure does collect drift. The needles are, have been found to do a better job of collecting drift than, than broadleaf trees. And multiple rows, if you have room, uh, is ideal. OK, like I said, we're mostly going to talk about, about site prep, weed control, and focusing on organic methods. And we've been working on organic site prep methods, a wide variety for a couple, probably 10 years now, um, largely driven by the organic farming community. So I'm so appreciative to you all for, for really asking for better methods not wanting to use herbicides in your, in your habitat, which is still kind of the, that's the mainstream way of, of doing habitat installations is to spray it out and plant your habitat, but we all can do better. There's a lot of different options. We will focus on a few of these, but I'm gonna start with smother cropping because this truly is an organic method. You're, you're really just using plants, smother crops or cover crops in a high density planting to outcompete weeds. The duration is, it can be one or more growing seasons. You really are just kind of out there. It depends on your weed pressure. You're monitoring your weed pressure um, and the control that you're getting. Timing is essential. I really love using this method with farmers who are already really familiar with cover cropping because they, they know when to plant such that they get good establishment and when to terminate. So, But if you're, if you're in that position, that's a, probably a great method for you. Species selection, so what you use will depend on your soils and your weeds, um, but buckwheat is a really good one in that it, it germinates so quickly, like three days, I want to say. And it has that broad leaf that really smothers out other weeds, and it flowers, which is kind of an added benefit. Um, you get some flowers during that site prep year. How you terminate will vary, but we typically try to terminate without cultivation. So use something that winter kills or that you can terminate without having to actually turn in such that you don't disturb the soil and potentially turn up additional weed seeds. So here's a neat example from a farm near Bemidji um, where they were dealing with an 80 acre hay field of a kind of an up and coming invasive weed, Burnett saxifrage in the, in the carrot family. They also happen to have two very endangered bees, one federally listed bee, the rusty patch bumblebee on their farm, and another threatened bee. Um, and we're really excited to do something for those bees. So we had this crop, and they're organic. So we didn't have herbicides um, and really didn't know much at all about how to control these, these weeds. But we tried solarization and we tried smother cropping. And this is showing the buckwheat smother crop. And then after termination and then and seeding, and then um, now, I don't know, just a couple of years later, we have diverse flowering habitat. But, but I mean, the striking thing here is this habitat flowers all season long with a lot of bumblebees' favorite foods. And what we were starting with was something that 
came into bloom, bloomed all at once, and then there was this long lull in bloom availability. And this flower also is not highly attractive. So pretty fun transformation. This is another example where we were using buckwheat as a smother before planting plugs, just as a kind of an added measure of trying to, trying to get some of the weeds out of that area. Um, this is a question for people who might want to do this. Did they mow this, winter kill this? What was, do you happen to remember? Um, this one is fresh, because this was just last year. But yeah, we, <laughs> and it's funny that you ask. So we did mow that, but a little late. So it had already started to seed out. And we did get, and then this was, this was planting. So this was July, I think this was the same day. So we terminated it, but seed was falling, planted. And then I visited again in September and buckwheat was solid in that area. So it had totally come back as a weed. But I was, I, I'm not, we'll, we'll see if it ends up being problematic. But I was kind of thinking of it as a bit of a nurse crop. So it's kind of shading, shading out other weeds in this area as the natives continue to grow. So did they um, rototill that then to incorporate or to, to terminate? Uh, probably. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember. OK, another example of smother cropping on a different soil type where buckwheat wouldn't have worked. Starting conditions were mostly quack grass. We used oats and millet, which can take pretty poor soils. And this is at York Farm, which is now Good Courage Farm out in Hutchinson. And we, we have yet to see how the natives will, will establish, but so far it's looking good. The, the covers for sure established well. Um, and just another quick example, this is a, a wet field on Waxwing Farm, starting with quack grass, water smart, other annual weeds. In this case, we use sorghum sudan and Japanese millet, which can take wetter soils. Both of them established well. We did two years, in this case, of smothers. The second year, just doing the sorghum sudan, because we were worried about millet coming back as a weed. But I actually just connected with the farmers this week, and neither of them have been a weed issue. And now it's in habitat. But the, the other tricky thing with the sorghum sudan and some of these larger biomass smothers is that they, they make a lot of biomass, and it's hard to get good seed to soil contact without somehow raking that off or burning that off. This was actually Karen's project, and they ended up burning it off prior to planting. So lots of options. Buckwheat's a good one to start with. I'm really interested in alfalfa, again, using alfalfa against Canada thistle for multiple years and haying it, um, so getting that alfalfa crop but, but as a hay crop, but keeping the, the thistle from setting seed and setting it back in that way. So if any of you have that interest as well, come talk to us. That's all on smother cropping for now, but jumping into a new method, solarization. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. The idea is you create a seed bed, you dig a trench around it, you lay plastic. Um, in this climate, it's, we pretty much need an entire growing season for that plastic. So you would lay it in the spring, pull it off in the fall, and then broadcast your seed. And that's, that's an ideal time to be seeding anyway. We're, we typically recommend the, the four to six mil UV stable clear high tunnel plastic. Used is great, and there's a lot of used high tunnel plastic floating around, um, so that's what I would definitely strongly recommend. You may need deer fence. If you have a lot of deer pressure, you can get the deer walking across the plastic and punching holes in it, and you see weeds coming up everywhere the deer have punched in. You don't want to till after you remove the plastic for the same reasons I mentioned earlier. It's not effective against some weeds. We'll talk about that. The, the issue with this is if you're starting with new plastic, it's very costly. And there's the plastic disposal issues and all of that. Um, but if you can find used plastic from your own high tunnel or another neighbor, I think it can be a nice method. It, it really does work. It's worked really well for us. And the reason for this trench is just to create a, a, a hole around the entire edge where you can easily bury the edges of your plastic rather than having to do all that by hand. If you have the six mil plastic, you can drive on it without damaging it if you need to. Mostly I've used like, pieces of plastic that are about a quarter acre in size. Um, and a lot of times farmers have more land than that that they want to turn into habitat. So what we've been doing in this farm, at this farm, we solarize this area to the left for one growing season. And then we, f we unburied three of the edges and flipped the plastic and seeded this area. And then that, section was solarized the following year. 
So in that way, you can move a single piece of plastic through a farm or through a field. And it takes some work to do this, so trying to have a work party or get some more people at the farm to help with this is helpful. Originally, when I started doing this, I had this idea that we would be able to buy a big piece of plastic and move it from farm to farm, which is really unrealistic <laughs> um, because the plastic is so dirty and heavy and there's weed seeds on it and you don't really want to be moving it. So, But moving it across the site does, does work. Here's a wet site. This is at Open Hands Farm where we had, I had no idea how this project was gonna turn out. We had a really wet, weedy basin that had been in Reed Canary for years, and there were even cattails in the middle. We solarized it with used plastic, just pieced together all these different parcels for a full growing season. Seeded it, that's March 28, 2016, and this is two years later. And it just, I mean, it looks like a flower garden. It's so colorful and beautiful and just dense, rich flowers. Which is partly, I think, thanks to the seed mix. We, we use the a wet basin detention mix that Prairie Moon sells that's full of different sedges and rushes and um, lots of wildflowers that come in and out of bloom. We also did solarization on our farm, Hooser Excuse, through this grant. And we did it in four different spots. And I'd say, you know, Sarah talked about doing it in a bigger area. We did do thin strips, and I think the bigger areas were more effective, but we just wanted to try everything, so we did. Um, we had one spot that was a really drier, sandier, almost gravelly soil. And I would say that the, the plants um, grew in more quickly there and were more dense right away, and they still continue to be dense. So that was actually a really thin strip that was up on the, or on the southern edge of one of our fields, and that's done really well, and it was pretty easy. This is a spot, like I said, that was basically reed canary and other um, wet grasses growing in. So it just happened that was maybe the one year since then that was dry enough for us to actually plow this ground. So Nick did plow it and then rototilled it and then we covered it with plastic. And we did use the Super C tractor to, to do, we already had the cultivation set up, so he just moved the knives and the shovels so that he could just drive along the edge and flip the soil. And so it was really quick to actually lay the plastic out and that worked really well. Um, we had that on all season. We seeded it in the fall. We're gonna talk about that seeding method later. And then it came the next spring and I was almost like, Sarah, what have we done? <laughs> it was all thistle. It was so bad, and I couldn't believe that we had turned this big, this grassy patch into thistle. But Sarah had told me, like, just wait. It's gonna, the first year's gonna be the worst, the first year's gonna be the weediest, and it will change, and it really has. So we managed the thistle through mowing. We mowed it down when it got, it, you know, just flowering, where it's putting all of its energy in the flower. And we really had to do that for about two years, and then we don't have very much thistle at all anymore. So it, don't be freaked out if you do these things and the first year looks really, really bad, because it just might, <laughs> but it's coming. And I think the other fun thing is um, this spot, every year is different, new species come up. Um, sometimes we have just extra plugs that we've grown up for other areas, and we'll, if they're wet loving, we'll just put the plugs in before rain and you know more stuff grows, and it's, it's just been fun to watch and see how that has evolved. Oh yeah, this is just an example, if some of you I know are on urban farms, of using solarization in a really small area um, where things maybe have to be kind of neat and trim and tidy. This is a community garden in Cambridge um, where we solarized this area. There was a bunch of bricks sitting around, so that's what we use for edging. And now it's flowering, and that's a longhorn bee visiting a, a rudbeckia. Um, and it's just been a really fun thing for the, for the garden to, to have that habitat there. And that was just mowed grass. We didn't cultivate it or anything. We just laid the plastic right over. Okay, so in our experience, solarization has worked well against quack grass, smooth brome, reed canary, Kentucky bluegrass, Canada goldenrod. Um, if you've got just a lot of that and nothing else and you want to diversify it. Burnett saxifrage, that weed I mentioned earlier, yellow bed straw. Um, it hasn't worked well against Canada thistle, as Joan is explaining. Um, yellow, a lot of times you put this plastic down and you pull it off and you have a totally different, you still have weeds maybe, but it's a totally different weed community. At our farm, when we pulled the plastic off, we didn't have any smooth roam. But all of a sudden there was purslane everywhere under that plastic, which is an edible weed, um, so that's fine. And it's so low growing and native, a native planting, you know, would never, it would never out compete or be an issue in a native planting. So you might see a transformation, but typically the transformations I've seen have been for the better. Um, yellow nut sedge is another one. In this photo, you can see the sedge under the plastic, and that was at Jones Farm. And that's faded out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's low growing. Okay, another method is 
repeat cultivation. This is what farmers tend to want to do because that's what folks are used to doing for their prep for vegetable for annual crops. Um, I'll just go out and till the field. It'll look nice, and I'm going to throw my seed down. Um, but usually, there's still a lot of weeds. I've, I found that this this method works the best if farmers really know their their weeds and their equipment and can be out there really timing their cultivation passes to hit weeds at their most vulnerable stages. And, and if you've got low weed pressure to start with, that's probably when this, this method is gonna work. So just an example, this was repeat cultivation used on a former cropland at Open Hands Farm. So this was a, an area of the farm that had been in, in corn and soy and wasn't performing well. Um, they bought the farm and converted it to organic vegetables and the vegetables didn't perform well, kind of like Joan's example earlier, um, and decided to put it into habitat. Um, but really the weed pressure was so low. If you're coming out of row crops, often the weed pressure is fairly low and um, it's pretty easy to get habitat going. Um, so something else we tried with Sarah, because. We thought we'd give it a go. We already were raising some pigs, just a small amount. Um, so this is an example of just a little t on the left-hand side in 2014 of that filter strip that I talked to you about. And I mentioned to you, like, reed canary was really encroaching upon that filter strip that we planted in certain areas where it was super wet. Um, so we thought we'd just try grazing pigs in it and see what would happen. So we had kind of two consecutive years with pigs on this one spot, and they just brewed up everything. I mean, you can see what they're on and is all rooted up is what it was looking like before and they love it. Um, I will say the years have gotten wetter and wetter, and so there was a point in which we did think about installing a diving board for our pigs, um, <laughs> but we made it out. I think Claire's here with the year, the year that we had to move them out of the wet so many times. But that being said, repeat cultivation is not gonna work in this spot. We can't even one time cultivate in this spot. And the solarization would definitely be an option, yeah. but I think it would have been really It would have been tough. a mess. Yeah, it would have been yeah. a mess. So the pigs were a really nice choice to give it a try. And some species thrive. If you were in the herbal workshop before this, blue vervain she mentioned. Blue vervain loves the wet areas on our farm, and it's such gorgeous blooms. So, you know, not without its challenges. Reed canary is still there. You know, they can't fully take it out. The roots are still on the ground. But definitely the, the plants that we planted, we did, we did plugs and we did overseeding. And um, the combination of those two was actually, I think, a really good winning way of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, so they were, again, I'll just say this again, the pigs were on that field for two years in a row. At the fall, once the pigs were off, then that was when we went in and did the overseeding and the, and the plug transplants in the fall for those that could be bare root planted in the fall. You're just seeing a couple flowers there, but it's so diverse and like every step you take. I've learned a lot of plants just visiting this site, and I feel like I don't even like to go there without a, a botanist or somebody who can really identify what we're seeing, because there's so many different things um, growing. And and the reed canary, like like Joan said, the reed canary is in there, but it's it's not in the canopy. It's not, at least at this point, flowering up and setting seed. It's um, The canopy is, is mostly flowers and native native grasses and sedges. And this is may change, and it's just something we have to monitor. Yeah. Um, so this is another area where we did that same thing. Um, this was a, a goal of ours was to do repeat cultivation on this spot and then turn it into habitat and like I mentioned couldn't do it So we did just mow this area. This is all reed canary and then we ran the pigs through there They took down absolutely everything else and then it did get dry enough that fall that Nick was actually able to then make a nice smooth seed bed So this is actually my kids and my husband and I overseeding in the fall and Sarah's going to talk about how that method works, but it was really fun as a family to go and do this, and now it's it's quite different. So it really was just reed canary on the left-hand side, and now it's yeah. it's a, it's not our most diverse mix, I will say. Like, we still have some challenges in that spot, but it's much more diverse <coughs> than it was before. Oh, this is another method that's kind of new to me um, that was introduced to me by a couple of farmers, I don't know, last year, and we had the opportunity to try on an Iowa farm this summer, but... The, I've, I've heard this called stale bedding or tarping or silage tarping, but the idea is you um, cultivate a seed bed, lay a heavy black tarp down, and leave it for just a few weeks, three, in this case three weeks, and, oh, sorry, and you irrigate prior to laying the, the plastic. Um, so you've got this warm, moist, dark soil that's stimulating weed seed germination under the plastic, but then those weed seeds don't have much to do um, without the light, and then you abruptly take that plastic off and expose those sprouts to the wind and weather um, and sun, and they die. 
People are using this for like for microgreens and carrots and beets and things that you really don't want to have to go in there and weed. Um, you, you need a period of time where you've just got kind of a weedless soil. But we used it as site prep for a native plug planting. And yeah, I connected with, with Mike at the end of the growing season to find out how things were going. And he said, zero, there's still zero weed pressure through the end of the season, yup, zero, um, which impressed me for a site prep method that only took three weeks. Um, and we were starting with field road conditions, so this was just a grassy path that they'd been, they'd been driving on. If you do try any of these methods against certain weeds, like the, the ragweed and solarization, I'd love to stay in touch and just hear what you all are finding, because um, we're, we're all learning about this together, really. Okay, so we're switching gears now to talk a little bit about Species selection, so what plants are you going to put in your habitat? How are you going to design your seed mix or your planting? Uh, most importantly, we really encourage folks to choose species that are native to your region. Um, you, can find, you can find native plant status at the county level um, by using like Minnesota wildflowers in Minnesota or just contacting a conservation planner in your area. Also, pay attention to your soil type and make sure that the species you're choosing, if you've got this wet site like Joan, that you're choosing species that like wet feet, for example, um, and you don't get that mismatch and, and really waste seed in an area where it's not gonna show up. We also really encourage diverse mixes, so including representatives from as many plant families as possible, um, trying to include plants that bloom all season long, you know, that will provide resources for things like bumblebees that are active early in the season all the way through fall, and things that maybe have a really short activity period in the early spring, and that's it. If you don't have flowers for them then, you're not gonna be supporting them. Um, so that nice long bloom succession, including plants with high insect value, and we have some plant lists on the back of plants that are just amazing at supporting a wide diversity of pollinators, all native to this region, these regions and all commercially available. Um, you might be in a situation where you need aggressive species. I remember designing the mixes for, um, for that reed canary area and we were really focusing on things that grew tall and strong and robust and would, would have a good chance at out-competing reed canary. But you also might need to be careful with aggressive species and make sure you're not putting in too much cup plant, for example, and getting a planting that's just overtaken by that one species. I mean, Joan, do you want to say more on this? I think you really covered it all. I think you just have to know your soils and the resources that are out there. Like, don't reinvent the wheel. One, there's experts at Xerxes, and I'm forgetting if we're going to talk about it here now or later, but um, we've mentioned prairie moon, prairie restorations. They have amazing resources for that. So there's no need yeah, for a lot of guesswork. Like this information is out there and you can take advantage of it. Maybe what's even more worth mentioning is that if, if you go through one of these NRCS programs and you get cost share funding, you will probably get directed to some cheap canned pollinator mix. Yeah, don't do that. Um, don't do that. <laughs> It's really worth getting a custom mix designed for your site, which you don't have to pay for that design. You would have a bigger seed bill um, if you go with a custom mix, but there's ways to still design a custom mix and keep costs down. And there's, there's places, like a lot of times, we'll work with a producer who's getting a certain amount of funding from the NRCS for a pollinator mix, but our organization is able to chip in a little bit more to make sure you have milkweed in that mix and you have liatris in that mix and you have something that's really much more valuable. So reach out, definitely reach out. Um, this is sort of an aside, but if you are doing a strip of, you know, we talked about, or I talked about those flowers that our CSA members can pick that are great for blooms. It's also worth noting in the seed catalogs that they say very little pollen in this because a lot of cut flower growers don't want a lot of the pollen in their cut flowers. That's oh, yeah. probably not a flower that you want for attracting pollinators. So True. keep an eye out for those, those words in seed catalogs. Okay, here we've, we've talked about this a little bit, but I think we'll just run through it as a little bit of a review. These are some of the differences between starting from seed and starting from transplants. So if you start from seed, it's lower cost. Transplants, higher cost, but can be low cost if you grow out your own plugs. Starting from seed, you need more pre-planting weed control. So generally, I recommend planting on a year of organic site prep. Um, with transplants, you need less of that since you're starting with a more competitive, larger plant. 
Starting from seed, you need mowing for weed management during the establishment years. So typically we're mowing those plantings a couple times a year for the first year for sure, and maybe the second year too, maybe onward. With the transplants, no mowing, um, maybe a little Minus spot. Minus the management of mowing. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and spot weeding as needed. From seed, you're usually not getting flowers until the third or fourth year. Starting from transplants, you can get blooming flowers that first year. Seed mix can be highly diverse. If you're starting from seed, it, it is easier to cram more diversity in a seed mix, I think, than a, than a plug planting. Um, but you don't always realize the diversity in your seed mix either. And you, there's ways to make plug plantings pretty diverse as well. Less control with starting from seed, more control with plugs. Seed is obviously better than plugs for, for large areas. We usually plan on one plug per square foot. So a tenth of an acre, that's about 4,000 plants. I wouldn't want to probably do too much more than that from plugs. No irrigation needed when you start from seed. You might need irrigation if you're starting from plugs, depending on the time of, of planting. Or you can always water, um, like Karen has done the ones on her farm with a water wheel transplanter. So they get watered at the time of transplant, but that's it. So this is what I was starting to mention before. Um, Prairie Mutant is one place that has really great resources for how to germinate. So these seeds, are, it's not just like popping a broccoli seed for those of you who are vegetable growers. Um, they do have some um, finickiness about them, some of these native plants. Some of them need to go through a stratification period, which is why so many of these seedings are done in the fall after, it's, after your seed bed prep is done. They need to go through that cold cycle and then warm up again to, to germinate. Um, but Prairie Mutant has this awesome germination code where it's like, this is exactly what you need to do. Each species is listed with its own germination code. It gives you all the instructions. But there's one, is it, is it code C? It's just like, just like your vegetables. Put it in the ground, code add water, it. light. Yeah. It will germinate. Um, that being said, though, you can see on the right there, if you do this, do not get down on yourself if you have a 20% germination rate. They tend to be a little harder to germinate than other of our, of our normal vegetable seeds. So don't, don't lose heart, but there's so many great resources about, out there for that. There's a lot of those really easy ones, like just like vegetables, pretty much. And if, you, if any of you want this list, you can email me and I can send it to you. Otherwise, just going through the Prairie Moon catalog, you can figure this out. Um, so we don't have anything different that we use for vegetables when we're starting transplants. It's our same mix that we use for our veggies. Um, we oftentimes will start them in an open flat, so a 10 by 20 just open flat filled halfway with soil. A lot of these are like surface. You need to see them at the surface. Some are a little bit of depth, so you have to be watching out for that. Some of them need light to germinate. Some of them need dark to germinate, so you got to also look out for that. But then what we do is um, we'll seed 200 seeds in an open 10, 20 flat, and then once they germinate and get big enough, we up-pot them into larger, into larger flats. So it could be up-potted into another open flat. We tend to up-pot them into 72 cells because it is just easy to transplant that way. Um, you don't have to get fancy with your equipment. Just do what you're already doing and work with what you already have. So again, I mentioned this before. You could do everything right and you still have really terrible germination. And some of them are just easier than others. Um, I have found maybe one of our trickiest things is damping off in our greenhouse. So that's something you need to be aware of. It's just not, not overwatering, not letting them sit and get soggy. And um, getting, again, going back to that catalog and finding out what it is that specific species need so that you're cultivating it as best that you can. Yeah, and if there's only so many that you feel like you're able to grow, but you want to have a more diverse planting, you can always supplement that with purchased plugs, a which plugs, yeah. yeah, are usually about a dollar a plug. Oh, and I will mention too, um, so I said a lot of the kind of native perennials we did, we seeded in open flats and then up potted. For the things like the cilantro, the dill, the cosmos, the bachelor buttons that were annuals, we actually did those in 128s, so we can kind of get more plugs. They weren't in the greenhouse for very long. It was literally like three, maybe four weeks. And then it just took up less space in our greenhouse because space is definitely a consideration. You know, we want to do these things. We want to grow them in our greenhouse. But primarily, we need to grow our vegetable plants that we're going to harvest. So these are things you can do in pretty small spaces and still have a lot of plants to work with. OK, I'm just going to cruise through these last few slides because we don't have a lot of time. But um, as far as seeding timing, <laughs> dormant seeding is best. Um, late fall or, or very early spring is ideal, um, partly because that time period helps those seeds break dormancy um, via the stratification of, of nature, the so warming and cooling and freezing and thawing. If you're planting an area, I would recommend 
you divide that area into a certain number of sections, so maybe into four sections, and then divide your seed into four containers, and then bulk that seed up with some bulking agent. So, at because you're gonna have a, you'll be surprised how little seed um, you have for an acre even. Um, so, to spread that out into a few containers and then add a bulking agent, I prefer sawdust and peat moss, both of which are often readily available on farms. And then you add some bulk to it, mix it all up, and then go out and, and evenly distribute your seed. Lots of different ways to do the seeding. If it's a small area, my favorite method is just hand broadcasting, so I feel like I have the most control. Um, but you can use belly grinders or grass seeders. I, for larger sites, I prefer the, the PTO broadcasters, and a lot of farms already have those. But a lot of people use, Steve mostly uses native seed drills, and which you just have to get good at if you're going to use them. And they are available for rent from a lot of conservation districts. So, yeah, when we seeded our field border, it was six acres, like I said, and we obviously didn't have that equipment, but we borrowed a brilliant seeder from one of our seed dealers in town, and it was easy enough. If you do broadcast seed, where you're just throwing the seed right down on the surface, depending on the time of year, but you'll probably want to run a cultipacker or a barrel over it just to really pack the seed in and increase seed to soil contact. If you're seeding in the fall, that's less important because the seed has the winter to kind of work its way down. But spring seeding, I would recommend that. The first year of establishment, you'll be mowing. Like I said, we typically recommend mowing two to three times that first year to control annual weeds. Because you'll be getting things, it'll look like Crunchy. a hot, <laughs> weedy mess. Yeah. You know, there'll be things like foxtail and rag, you know, ragweed, lambs, different things coming up, but not concerning. Annual weeds are not an issue, um, usually. And your natives will be coming up too, but they're slow growing, they'll be low. If you keep mowing, you're actually bringing more light to those natives and giving them the chance to really root down and develop a stronger plant. Don't feel bad mowing flowers. Everybody feels bad mowing flowers, but when you start seeing black-eyed Susans, that's like, that's time to mow. <laughs> do it. So this is in our farm. Um, we did do a burn in 2017 on the field border and filter strip. It just so happens that one of our share members works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and he's the burn manager. And for two six packs, he burned our field for us. It's great. Um, so that has worked really well. Um, we also have two little pet goats. They're male weathers. They're really good for nothing but eating. And so we figured we might as well use them for that. So we've been, I told you, but willow has been a problem for us, um, creeping in, in those wet areas where we had our field borders. And goats just love it, and they eat it down. Even these two little ones, which are our kids' pets, will eat a lot of willow in a day. Um, when I talked to our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, because they're actually our neighbors to the east, um, he said the best thing you can do is to graze that same spot over multiple years. Um, but if that's not an option for you, um, grazing goats in like late summer, early fall, you'll get your biggest bang for your buck of damage to those willows coming back. There's something for everyone. I hope you all found something here that you're excited about trying. Also, we had to go through things really fast. This is clearly a lot of information. There's so many farms. You all had different situations. I just really want to impress upon you the resources that you have at hand. Talk to Xerxes of what they do. They want you to come to them with questions. If you haven't already, make a connection with your local NSCS office because that was literally how we got turned on to this. We just went in and said, hey, we just bought this farm. We don't really know about what you have out there. Like, what can we do? And actually, the folks there were super excited because we're, we're sort of atypical for our region. So like, yeah, I'll look through the books and find something that matches with your farm. So if you haven't already made a connection with your NRC office, you should do it now. And then finally, <laughs> a message is like, it's fun. This is really fun. I, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to, but I'm going to raise my hand. Is there any times when you've gone out to your farm fields and you felt some sort of anxiety? <laughs> OK. I all, all the time, I do. And you know, it's weather, it's past. You look at them, you're like, oh, this is going wrong. I just All I can see is work when I go out to my fields. Well, when I need some soul respite, I just go to our pollinator plantings because it's really fun. Um, in fact, part of our NRCS equip grant, we were, had to monitor our bees for the next three years. So like literally, I had to take a meditative walk at this pace, counting bees. It is very <laughs> good for your soul. Um, and so just like, we, we're doing these things because they're great for pollinators and we need them, but we can also do these things because we're giving back to the land on which we are graced to raise food. And I think keeping that in mind as you're installing a habitat is like one way, and I really like what Leah said yesterday about 
we have to give thanks to this land that is, mm -hmm. is giving us so much. And this is a way of saying thanks in a really physical way, too. Um, and it's just fun. Like, those are elderberry scones in that back picture we made. This is our, you know, we go out and collect seeds every fall and then spread them in different areas in the farm. Um, before my daughter got into kindergarten, we used to, on her off preschool days, go on adventures. So this is her adventure backpack, and we take a pair of pruners, and we just walk through our plantings and, and make bouquets. And I just, we want to stress, like, this is also just really, really fun and good for you as a, as a person and as a human. So, yeah. Yeah, and Joan's musings, musings on this being her, her soul work um, mm -hmm. reminded me of this quote by Masanobu Fukuoka, the, the author of um, One Straw Revolution, Japanese farmer, um, really transformative thinker and you know, leader in the global sustainable agricultural movement, and, and really put a lot of, of thought and energy and momentum into these ideas of farming with nature, in nature, rather than separate from and, and potentially against nature. And he writes, the healing of the land and the purification of the human spirit is the same process. Thanks to Sarah Foltz Jordan from the Xerxes Society and Joan Olson from Prairie Drifter Farm. And thank you for listening to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast and remember to register for the post podcast farmer chat. Moses educates farmers in sustainable and organic agriculture. Call the Organic Answer Line to ask a specialist about organic farming and certification at 888-90-MOSES or visit mosesorganic.org slash ask. Register now for the Growing Stronger Collaborative Conference at bit.ly slash growingstronger2021. Get $25 off if you register in December. Thanks again to our patron sponsor, Gemplers. Visit gemplers.com. If you have any questions about today's episode or have ideas for future episodes, please contact me at chuck at mosesorganic.org. Our theme song is Summerfields by the Tenements. Thanks again for listening.